got your notebook. There's more. Welcome to season two, episode 22 of CN Live, War Crimes. I'm Joe Loria, Editor-in-Chief of Consortium News. The report of a four-year-long Australian government investigation into alleged war crimes by the country's special forces in Afghanistan was published last Thursday, revealing unspeakable atrocities against civilians. The report details how at least 25 members of Australia's Special Air Services, SAS, were involved in 39 murders of civilians. The report's description on page 120 of just one incident suffices to describe the nature of these crimes. It says, special forces would cordon off a whole village taking men and boys to guest houses, which are typically on the edge of a village. There, men would be tied up and tortured by special forces, sometimes for days. When the special forces left, the men and boys would be found dead, shot in the head, or blindfolded with throats slit. Members of the SASR were driving along a road and saw two 14-year-old boys whom they decided might be Taliban sympathizers. They stopped, searched the boys, and slit their throats. The rest of the troop then had to clean up the mess, which involved bagging the bodies and throwing them into a nearby river. The report on page 29 describes a practice known as blooding, The inquiry has found, it says, that there is credible information that junior soldiers were required by their patrol commanders to shoot a prisoner in order to achieve the soldier's first kill in a practice that was known as blooding. It goes on to say that objects, radios, uh, weapons were then planted on the bodies of many of these civilians, unarmed civilians, who were killed in cold blood. 19 of these 25 soldiers are facing criminal prosecution. The unit has been disbanded. As many as 3,000 soldiers will have their medals stripped. And special forces in future will all have to wear body cams. Now, there's also an attempt, according to uh, the Australian press, to give immunity to some of these soldiers so that they might be able to implicate more senior officers. These kinds of crimes that the report describes show an unbroken link to colonial barbarity dating back to the 19th century when Western soldiers jacked up to kill their inferiors, then as now, are unleashed on innocent populations in developing countries. The Australian government was made aware of such allegations by an army lawyer in Afghanistan named Major David McBride, who came forward as a whistleblower. After they ignored him, he went to the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. They took his story and reported it in July 2017 in a report called The Afghan Files. For his efforts, McBride was arrested and is still being prosecuted for divulging classified documents marked Australian eyes only. This even after his stories were vindicated by the government's report last Thursday. McBride faces life in prison. For its efforts, the ABC's offices were raided by the Australian Federal Police and copies of files were taken from newsroom computers. That raid took place less than two months after the April 2019 London arrest of the Australian Julian Assange, the WikiLeaks publisher who had himself revealed war crimes in Afghanistan and Iraq. An ABC journalist, Dan Oakes, who was co-author of the July 2017 Afghan Files article, who was facing prosecution for publishing classified information just like Assange's, had his charges suddenly dropped on October 15th, just a month before the government report confirmed McBride's story and Oaks' reporting. There may be a tide turning, however. Just last week, Mark Willisey and the Four Corners team at the ABC received the Gold Walkley Award, the highest honor for an Australian journalist, for their investigative report earlier this year revealing similar crimes in Afghanistan as the government's report later detailed. This was a story a lot of Australians did not want to watch or know about. It was a story that uncovered some very disturbing behaviour by our most elite soldiers. And it showed for the first time a war crime caught on camera. It was one of our SAS soldiers killing an unarmed, frightened Afghan man cowering on the ground. 
This was footage that later became evidence for the Inspector General of Defence in his groundbreaking report on war crimes. And the other thing this story revealed to the military was that some of these men alleged to have pulled the trigger were still serving in the Special Forces. Rumours and allegations of war crimes committed by Australian Special Forces are now the subject of a wide-ranging inquiry. It's being conducted by the Inspector General of the Australian Defence Force and headed by the New South Wales Supreme Court Judge, Paul Brereton. For almost four years, his inquiry has been looking into dozens of alleged incidents, an investigation that's had to penetrate the veil of secrecy around the Special Forces. We have obligations at international law, domestic law, and indeed moral obligations to not ignore these sorts of allegations. There is potential for a prosecution under, or certainly for charges to be laid under um, the war crimes murder provisions of the Commonwealth Criminal Code. Meanwhile, the United States during its history has committed many war crimes during its many wars with few investigations, let alone convictions. The Trump administration has refused to join the International Criminal Court and has threatened ICC officials for daring to probe US actions in Afghanistan. The US media does not investigate such allegations, protecting its own. All this adds to a culture of American impunity. Harold Pinter, the playwright, perhaps said it best when receiving the Nobel Prize, noting that the US war crimes, quote, have only been superficially recorded let alone documented, let alone acknowledged, let alone recognized as crimes at all. It is as if it never happened. The United States supported, and in many cases engendered, every right-wing military dictatorship in the world after the end of the Second World War. I refer to Indonesia, Greece, Uruguay, Brazil, Paraguay, Haiti, Turkey, the Philippines, Guatemala, El Salvador, and of course, Chile. The horror the United States inflicted upon Chile in 1973 can never be purged and can never be forgiven. Hundreds of thousands of deaths took place throughout these countries. Did they take place? And are they, in all cases, attributable to US foreign policy? The answer is yes. They did take place. And they are attributable to American foreign policy. But you wouldn't know it. It never happened. Nothing ever happened. Even while it was happening, it wasn't happening. It didn't matter. It was of no interest. The crimes of the United States have been systematic, constant, vicious, remorseless, but very few people have actually talked about them. You have to hand it to America. It has exercised a quite clinical manipulation of power worldwide while masquerading as a force for universal good. It's a brilliant, even witty, highly successful act of hypnosis. Joining us to discuss these latest developments in Australia and in the United States is ABC journalist Peter Cornell, who's the author of a new book called Secret Australia, based on WikiLeaks files about Australia, and by Colonel Anne Wright, a former US military officer and diplomat. Peter and Anne, welcome to CN Live. Thanks for coming on. No Thank problem. You. Good to see you, Joe. All right. Peter, I'm going to start with you to talk about Australia first, and then we'll move over to Anne uh, and talk about uh, the history of impunity and U.S. war crimes. Uh, what, uh, in, Peter, in your view, is the significance of this IG report in terms of Australians coming to terms with what its soldiers have done? Well, on one level, it's absolutely fantastic that the Inspector General has done the job that they're supposed to do and report in great detail recommend charges and, you know, try to do a clean out of the bad elements within the SAS and the command structure that allowed it to happen. However, on the other hand, these are things that we've known or had details about happening for a decade or more. 
it's taken a long, long time for it to get to the Inspector General. I remember Four Corners did a report on the capture and kill program in the SAS back in 2011. And even before that, we'd done other stories. And the, the, the stories we were doing were, you know, knocking off people on the say-so of local tribal chiefs uh, and doing raids that had um, collateral damage based on intelligence gathered by locals who had question marks around their veracity. Um, so here we are um, 10 years later and the report comes out. Um, just yesterday, a current politician in Australia, a Liberal, who was a former troop commander in the SAS, the Special Air Services Unit, Andrew Hastie, has come out and made his comments known about this. He was not involved, he says, in any of those atrocities, and I'm not suggesting he was. But um, oh, he was involved in one incident where they cut off the hands of dead Taliban to try to identify them later through fingerprints I, I, or handprints. And, uh, you know, that, that's different from killing children, slitting throats. But, um, but he's, he's come out and raised the issue that the report doesn't point high enough, doesn't um, thoroughly ask the questions why the stories that Four Corners, the ABC and others were doing, why the rumours, um, I mean, I heard named officers in the SAS in 2013 it was the first time I heard about the killing of children and um, why it's taken this long for this to be churned through the system. Um, it looks like a cover-up. Um, the raids on the ABC feel like a cover-up. Um, what were the raids being done for other than to stop the publication of ABC stories about, about Afghanistan and about the atrocities Australians were alleged to be involved in? It had a chilling effect. Um, right through the organisation, right through other stories. There was a story being done at the very moment that the raids took place. An interview um, uh, had been lined up for the next day with uh, a person, not a whistleblower, but an insider who knew some facts about another story. As soon as the raids happened, they pulled out, they cancelled the interview and they've disappeared off the radar now. It's, it's had a chilling effect. It isn't just the intimidation of those journalists working on the Afghan stories, not just intimidation of David McBride in suggesting that now the authorities will have all the communications between him and the ABC, but it has a much, much broader chilling effect on all sorts of people, public servants, um, people within the services. And really, it, all of this boils down to the whistleblowers, the... Um, the gold Walkley that was won the other night by Mark uh, Willisey and his team um, was only possible by the brave decisions of serving and ex-members of the ADF, the Australian Defence Force. And, you know, never before has have Australians seen the things we saw in that program that Mark put together. There was helmet cam footage shot of an Australian SAS member contemplating, discussing, and then carrying out the alleged murder of a young Afghan. It's, it's, it was there in, in the lounge rooms, widescreen, full colour. Um, the only uh, redactions were, were the faces of the SAS people. And, and some of the swear words used as the, uh, the SAS guy was considering whether to end the life of this young person on the ground. And he did it, bang, fired a few shots into this guy lying on the ground, holding up his prayer beads. Now, for that to be shown um, in the lounge rooms across Australia to the, the middle-class audience that watches programs like Four Corners, had an astounding effect. And any chance that um, there was for a cover-up uh, uh, through the, this report being done by the Inspector General, which is then not handed to the public, but handed to defence to then work out how they deal with it, any chance of a cover-up then really uh, evaporated. The, um, it, it was undeniable. Now, we don't know the circumstances that 
kid lying on the ground could have been a murderous Taliban fighter. But um, from all we know, he may not have been that. He was killed on suspicion. And um, But then, look, like, we don't know the full story. It'll have to come out in court. The allegations will have to be tested. Uh, proper evidence will have to be given. Mitigating circumstances will need to be looked at. But it's a rare thing to see an Australian soldier murder someone, like, allegedly murder someone lying on the ground while you're sitting on your sofa um, after dinner in, in suburban Australia. So it, it had an, a massive effect, um, that. Now the charges uh, that were being contemplated against a ABC journalists uh, have been dropped. There's no, um, uh, uh, they were dropped because it was not seen to be in the public interest to pursue them. Well, my question obviously is how was it in the public interest to pursue them initially? I mean, what, what changed? Well, I think we know some things changed. The public learnt more. Um, so, you know, through this sort of thing, um, how on earth uh, this has remained buried for so long um, and, and not come to the notice of the higher leadership is just beyond belief. Because if me, just a mere journo, um, talking to people around the traps in 2013, heard stories about um, innocent kids being killed, I was unable to go any further. The source flatly refused, but the source was enormously well connected, but flatly refused to um, to take it further. But if me, just a mug journo, can come up with that, how how is it possible? How is it earthly possible that those stories were not heard within the upper echelons of the Australian Defence Department? They must have been heard. I can't believe that these people's ears are so deaf to these sorts of things. If you hear a if you hear a story of a, a rumour, people are saying, oh, there were rumours around. Really? If you're the commander of the Australian Defence Force and you're told there's a rumour going round of civilians being murdered by your, your men, because they're men, um, what do you do? You say, oh, it's a rumour, forget about it. Or do you start an investigation? I know it should happen. But um, yeah, here we are, the report's out. Um, uh, trials will, will start in a couple of years. It's taking that long. Uh, eventually, there'll be some form of justice. Meanwhile, back in Af Afghanistan, the, the people the Australians killed are still as dead as they were at the time. Their families are still as distraught and left without breadwinners and family members. Um, there's talk of compensation. Um, that's great. That's great. Compensation for that. Compensation for war crimes. I mean, you know, you've got to start asking yourself, where does that end? Because how many... How many Afghan children have died in uh, drone strikes that Australia's uh, um, support of, of those attacks ha ha have enabled? So it, it unravels um, from uh, a report like this. And I just know that the efforts to make sure that unravelling doesn't continue are, are, are pretty full on. But it's a window. It's, it's like Chomsky says, Occasionally stories break out, you know, it's like a wild animal in a zoo and it breaks out of the cage and suddenly everyone jumps up and down saying, oh, gosh, there's a wild animal, let's chase it. And so for a few weeks or sometimes only days, um, uh, that, 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 that window is open and these sort of stories can be done. So it's a very dangerous period at the moment, but um, that's why Defence Department has a PR department. You know, they'll be, they'll be working out a strategy for the next coming months of, um, of brass bands and, you know, various things to try to, to reassure the Australian public that, um, that things are okay. So it's been a very, very interesting time, Joe. Well, people, uh, I had a list of questions here and you answered almost all of them already, but I <laughs> thought of a few more. So. Okay, go for it. Why did they begin ultimately this investigation, I suppose, in 2016, if it was a four-year report? What, what, what do you think for them to do that? Well, well, it was complaints from uh, servicemen, people, you know, members of, of the SAS who, who made internal complaints. And um, initially they were uh, shafted off to uh, in another direction, not to the Inspector General, but to uh, a psychologist, a, a woman who was hired to look at these people's PTSD and their issues and to try to work out, you know, what was going on with them. 
And through that process came out with uh, a lot of detail about terrible things that had happened in Afghanistan. And her report then recommended a proper investigation. It bounced through a couple of hands and finally landed in the lap of the Inspector General, the place that it should have uh, gone to. And I think it's four years now it's taken for, uh, for this to happen. I mean, if, if, um, if Four Corners took four years to, to prepare a, a report on a, on, a, on a story, investigative story, you know, we'd be a laughing stock, you know. It's a, you know, justice delayed is denied, you know. It, it, you know, as soon as this, these, this information was known, you know, within weeks there should have been a, a plain load of investigating federal police or whoever, defence uh, security people heading to Afghanistan to locate and interview witnesses. You know, it doesn't need to take a long time. These things can be done very quickly if there's a will. Now, um, now the, the report, Killing Field, that won the award uh, for ABC Four Corners, that was broadcast in April, is that correct? Uh, yeah, from memory, that's correct. Um, er, I'm... It's a bit hard in COVID to, to sort of remember which month is which, I have to admit, Joe. So the, so the raid took place, I believe, in May. Is that right? The raid of the ABC offices in Sydney. Oh, the raid was last year. So um, the raid, yeah, the raid was 2019. Well, they, did they have a, was the raid related to this report? Uh, not, to, not to the Killing Fields. Killing Fields was done, it, it, was, a, it was an act of... Um, of great courage by the ABC after it had had its journalists intimidated and after it had uh, the raids on the ABC that downloaded tens of thousands of electronic files from the place. Um, it, it was an act of, um, of courage for the ABC to say, well, this is not going to stop our reporting. Um, and um, obviously the journalists involved in, in that case couldn't continue um, doing doing that reporting for obvious reasons if they were going to have court cases coming up. If they were going to face jail like Julian Assange, then then suddenly they had to, you know, pull their horns in. So uh, uh, another journalistic team jumped onto it and um, and have done a remarkable job in, uh, in pursuing this and not letting it go. And th this is the finest traditions of journalism to do this sort of reporting. I can be critical of the media and I can be critical of some of the, the work journalists do, but, but to, to say in the light of the federal police storming into our building, I mean, they walked quietly in suits, um, uh, but to, um, to, to invade the, uh, the media and not to see it as some kind of um, breach of the media's role, um, you know, it was it was a moment that um, that a lot of people had to make decisions over, and fortunately, we went the right way. The ABC leaped, leapt in the right direction, and decided to to go for it with these stories and to keep on telling the facts as far as uh, could be ascertained. And Mark and the team who worked with him um, from the investigative unit, as well as from uh, Four Corners, uh, there was combined effort here. Um, did a brilliant job in, in bringing that out. And um, I've got to say the, the whistleblowers who provided the footage did a pretty brilliant job too because, um, you know, it's television. And, uh, you know, if you're going to tell a story, <clears throat> you need the pictures. But, but I, I, I had never imagined that I would see a killing uh, like I saw uh, on the screen. Were you at the ABC offices the day that that uh, raid took place? Yeah, yeah, I was. It was a strange day, and um, um, we were we we got advance notice that they're about to hit the building, and because they're very polite here in Australia, it's not like a repressive regime. I won't name countries, but but you know the, the, the federal police ring and say, "Oh hi," you know, we're going to be popping down there so, shortly to to. Um, to execute a search warrant, we'd like access. So I wonder if you could meet us at the door and get passes for us. So it's all done very gentleman, gentlemanly like. Um, so yeah, yeah, we were there. We all got a notice that this was going on um, at the time, and obviously, people didn't know how far the raid was going to be. And there's a lot of sensitive stories being worked on in the ABC. And for the AFP to have, lap, you know, plug their laptops into the ABC system 
which just through a password can access story content of stories being prepared, was a pretty shocking moment to a lot of journalists, I can tell you, including myself. And the idea that, um, that through, uh, well, an interesting thing was the warrant actually talked about removing materials from the ABC, but also placing materials on the ABC uh, electronic servers. So perhaps it wasn't done, we don't know, but th the warrant allowed the, the placing of items, uh, the you know, the downloading onto the ABC system of items. Now they could be apps or search tools, they could be covert search tools, they could be who knows, we don't know. We, we don't know. So it, it, was a, it was a big shock to the ABC to see this happen. It was a big shock to young journos, you know, journos in their 30s and, and so to see this because in their lifetime they'd never seen this sort of thing. You know, someone of my great vintage remembers search warrants and, you know, we've had search warrants at uh, Four Corners in the past um, and, um, and the ABC has been intimidated in many ways, but a lot of these younger journos had never seen this before. So it was a huge wake up call. It's uh, for our American audience. I mean, it's impossible to conceive, you know, I'm not giving a pass because we're going to talk with Anne in a moment about the US and its history with this stuff, but the idea of the FBI going into the New York Times office and doing what they did over at uh, ABC is just uh, not possible, even during the Pentagon Papers, while they tried mm. to function to stop them from publishing, which yeah. is, well, return, they didn't go into the New York Times offices to seize uh, the material, which was the Pentagon Papers, which they hadn't fully published yet. They were, yep. they published much, so that didn't even happen there. So that's just quite extraordinary. Uh, I think that's really... Uh, and and Joe, yeah. Joe, let me say also that um, there were three raids planned at that time. One had occurred the day before on a News Limited, uh, sort of News Corp uh, mm -hmm. journalist who had revealed a document about the military spy agency um, seeking powers to spy on civilians in Australia. Now, that's enormous change in the role of that spy agency. It's the Australian Signals Directorate, which is the Australian equivalent of the NSA. And, and a paper had been prepared, uh, preparing for a legislative change that would allow uh, them to uh, turn, you know, their, their spying abilities, which are pretty comprehensive, we know from Snowden, uh, internally. Now, of course, it was under the umbrella of uh, chasing pedophiles or um, chasing drug networks or uh, whatever the current um, the current fear uh, meme uh, is for the public. Um, however, we all know uh, that these things are used and can be used for other purposes, for other for just for monitoring of journalists, not even not even specifically spying and targeting, but it's doing general monitoring. That this thing happens and for the military grade spy agency to be turned inward in Australia was a huge uh, release. They raided this woman's home in Canberra. They, well, the, the, the line is they searched through her panties drawer. They went through everything. They pulled the oven apart. They went, they totally were clearly looking for um, a, a, a thumb drive or a photograph or a document. And um, uh, such an intrusive um, uh, assault on a person's home, a journalist in Canberra, a member of the National Press Gallery, uh, shocked us all. Next, the next thing we had the ABC raid. And we, uh, we learn that the day after the ABC raid, the federal police had planned on raiding the headquarters of News Corp in Australia, the Australian newspaper here in Sydney. And they called that off because of the public response uh, to the raid on the ABC headquarters. And one of the things with the ABC raid in the headquarters was it was live tweeted. The head of uh, uh, news and investigations for the ABC is a guy called John Lyons. He's a former journalist and he's, he's been around He's, he's been around the traps for a while and he's smart enough to accompany the AFP people and they got a room for them and he live tweeted the whole event, um, took photos, took photos, quoted them and, and just showed this whole farcical uh, effort of, uh, 
of people peering into a laptop trying to find out the secrets of the ABC. It was, it was an astounding thing and, and uh, it just showed that they'll do it. You know, it, it wasn't theoretical anymore. They will hunt down journalists and whistleblowers in Australia. And David yeah. McBride's the, the, the shining example at the moment. You know, where does he go? He's been vindicated, but he's still got to go to court. He's still facing jail. Yep, the one if Rupert Murdoch was tipped off about that impending raid of News Corp, as you just <laughs> all of the reporters' home. I remember at the time uh, reading about the raid on her home and the panties, yes. And uh, the, the Telegraph, the Sunday Telegraph, it's the paper she worked for, they came yep. out with a very strong editorial against what had happened. So yep. the Murdoch newspaper against the establishment and the yep. law yep. enforcement. It was, it was a big moment. And, and the ABC and News Corp and um, most of the other major news outlets in Australia united at that time and, um, and started a campaign for media freedom, uh, which was unheard of, and, uh, and published massive full-page ads, you know, full cover wraparounds about media freedom. This is a result that the AFP didn't imagine. Uh, I mean, when was the last time News Limited and the ABC were united in, in anything? <laughs> you know, they tend to, uh, uh, if not competing, um, you know, sometimes snipe at each other. But here, here we had them drawn together for a common battle for media freedom. It was a, an astounding moment in Australian journalism. And, um, and to some extent, it's been helpful in some ways. It, it has put the issue into the public eye uh, like never before. Now, you, you said there had been raids before. Uh, so it's a complete coincidence in your view that these two raids that happened on consecutive days took place about a month after Julian Assange was dragged out of the embassy and arrested for publishing. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a coincidence? yeah. I, I, I can't imagine that these guys would pay much attention to Julian Assange, to be, yeah. to be honest. But, um, but the, co the, coincidence, the coincidence in timing is, is pretty remarkable. Um, there, there've been other raids and, and search warrants in the past. And, um, uh, the most notable to my mind was the raiding of a, of a Canberra journalist who I know, uh, a couple of times has had his entire, uh, you know, he's had the carpet pulled up in his house. He's had the entire, you know, everything, uh, searched, uh, twice over, over stories to do with national security. Um, uh, and, um, you know, it's the most shocking thing I, I'd heard of prior to this, uh, this spate of raids and, and the ABC raid. So um, on one hand, yeah, it does intimidate people. On the other hand, we've got Mark Willisey now winning the gold Walkley for having done a report following the raid. Yes. So it didn't stop the ABC. From doing yep. uh, and it may have... Uh, why ultimately do you think the Inspector General, I think you mentioned this earlier, decided not to cover it up and had to publish it? What forced their hand? Well, no, no, no the Inspector General hands it over to Defence, um, the Ministry, Defence Minister, who then, um, you know, reads it and considers and takes advice, legal advice on how then, which recommendations to follow and how to deal with it. I mean, Linda Reynolds, the Defence Minister, said she was, she actually became physically sick when she read the report. Now, she's former military. She's 20 odd years in defense in the army reserve she's you know she's been around and she understands how it works but um look, look some of the, some of the report is actually still redacted let me tell you and um it, it's been described as potentially uh some of the worst crimes ever known to have happened allegedly uh by the australian um uh, Defence Force. Now, what they are, we don't know because they're redacted, and 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 the whistleblowers are not talking about it because now there are court processes is in, and they don't want to jeopardise that. But can you imagine? Uh, there's at least two. There's one whole page that's almost totally black. There's another page where uh, the paragraph talking about the alleged crime is totally black. Can you imagine what they could be? If they could, they be worse than slitting the throats of two 14 year old boys and throwing their bodies into a creek in a bag? I mean, you know, you know look, I'm just aghast at, at, at what's in it, but um, I, I'm happy for it to be redacted on the basis that it will emerge in court in due, due time. 
there'll be witnesses who don't want to be jeopardised. I understand that there's a process that will be gone through. And I have to say congratulations to, to the Minister for Defence for um, quickly, publicly releasing it very quickly after she'd, um, she'd obtained a copy. She became ill. That reminds me of when Donna Rumsfeld testified after the Abu Ghraib photos became uh, public. And he said that he was, I don't know if he said physically ill, but he was very disturbed about it. That leads me to my last question before we bring Anne in. Um, you mentioned Chomsky saying that a story can come out like a lion out of a cage. And, you know, <laughs> when Eli happened, and Eli massacred. That was a big story. Yes. Yeah. A lot of people. And then the Abu Ghraib story. But for the most part, uh, and then we see uh, most of these stories go away. And, yeah. and of Assange revealing the collateral murder, that probably lasted just a few days. Yeah, and well, let's... Died, nothing yeah. happened. Like how yeah. happened. <clears throat> so what's the lasting impact of these revelations in Australia? Do you think, or will there be one? Well, uh, that's a really good question because um, atrocities. I mean, Australia's had atrocities since... Uh, since Lieutenant Cook from the English Navy shot an Aborigine before he even landed in the place. So, I mean, you know, atrocities in Australia, there's, there's been a few. Um, even close to where I'm sitting uh, in Sydney, there's a, a place called Bloody Point. It's only just been recognised where, where a small a small massacre of Aborigines took place at the hands of the British Army. But why doesn't this change things? Because the media has a beautiful way of turning these moments that become public into episodes and 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 making sure people don't doubt that the system is fine but bad apples rogue elements small episodes occasionally happen and in fact i've heard some of the commentary saying well this just shows that the the military justice system is running perfectly that you know when these things come to light they're dealt with well i'm sorry i mean it, it, it doesn't, it's not the reality. The reality is, well, count up the number of dead civilians in Afghanistan and say, where's the accountability for them? Count up the number of just dead civilians, children in Afghanistan. I read something about 2,000 in drone strikes, children. Uh, I mean, if we're killing ch children, should we have a bit of a think about this? You know, it, it's an ongoing thing. Drones kill people pretty indiscriminately and... Um, uh, the U.S. base uh, just outside Alice Springs at Pine Gap is an integrated part of the system that targets people on the ground for killing. Now, there's, you know, more than half the people that work in the base are American, but there's a good half of them almost Australian. What, what's our culpability? What, what, where is the Inspector General on those deaths? You know, we're aware of this. We know it happens. It's a systemic part of our U.S. relationship. It's, it's how Australia fits into the empire. We have a task to, to, to play, and that is to assist uh, the main uh, empire to do whatever the tasks it wants around the world. You know, for a while it's been, you know, have, you know push the standoff with China. With Biden, perhaps it's going to be uh, bombing the fuck out of Iran. Who knows? Whatever it is, Australia will be there. Australia will fight on because we only have episodes. We don't do bad things. We just have bad apples. And I tell you what, if you get rid of the bad apples, the barrel's fine. So, look, I'm sorry. I'm really cynical about this because, you know, the death of one child is regrettable. And um, to think that 2,000 have died without, without an eye in Australia in officialdom uh, looking across those stories. The SAS one broke out and it had to be told. It was not going to go away. And the media, you know, chased it and made it happen. But, um, you know, there's a lot of other dead bodies in Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria that Australia has had a direct hand in creating. No one's investigating them. Uh, and no one will uh, say, I've got to be honest, you know, we'll pursue, we'll pursue the bad apples. We'll get these couple of uh, SAS guys, these 20 or 30 SAS guys, we'll chuck a few of them into jail. We'll pat ourselves on the back and it'll be problem solved, but it won't be problem solved. It will be Australia will continue the same old, old uh, role we have in the world. And that yep. is throwing up our military when it's needed and throwing open our arms to foreign companies to exploit our minerals. I mean, it's just a dumb, dumb role we play at the moment. And um, 
one would hope that through an incident like this with, with us murdering children, allegedly, that there would be uh, a consideration of maybe there's something rotten in the system itself. Uh, right. but, but mainstream media won't let that discussion really happen. So, Joe, it's up to you. <laughs> Sounds more like a rotten orchard than a rotten apple. Um, uh, well, I want to say. I want to come back uh, after we, we're now going to go to Anne Wright in Hawaii, and um, we're going to come back at the end of that to talk more about the U.S.-Australian relationship. You just touched on it, but I want to go further with both of you then. So, Anne, tell us uh, about yourself, because you've not been on CN Live before, just a little bit brief background and what happened during the Iraq wars of particular interest. Well, I was in the U.S. military for 29 years, 13 on active duty, 16 in the reserves, I also joined the uh, U.S. State Department uh, and served in embassies in Nicaragua, Grenada, Somalia, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, Sierra Leone, Micronesia, uh, Afghanistan. I was on the small team that helped reopen the embassy in Afghanistan of December of 2001. And then after I was there about six months, I went on to my, what turned out to be my last assignment, which was the deputy ambassador in Mongolia. And it was there in March of 2003 that I ended up resigning in opposition to the war on Iraq. Uh, I, I was in Afghanistan in 2001, uh, December of 2001, um, when we reopened the embassy. The CIA had already been in Afghanistan for three months. Special forces had been there for a month and a half before we reopened the embassy. Um, we found out uh, that during that time, uh, the CIA was already using facilities at Bagram Air Base and the salt pit at, in Kabul and various other facilities where they were holding people and torturing them. And I'll just kind of, I'll, let me flip over to Iraq for just a minute because what Peter was talking about and, and what the investigation in Australia about the atrocities there um, or in Afghanistan, but the atrocities that the U.S. had done also in Iraq, which got public attention, which was the Abu Ghraib prison and the, the, the bringing out of the photographs of what the U.S. military was doing to people held in, in Iraq. And as Joe, as you said, that uh, Rumsfeld was horrified, he said, when he saw the photos. Well, he also hid, uh, and they still are in the vaults of the Pentagon, they say thousands of pictures that are even worse than the ones that the public saw. Well, I, I go back to Afghanistan because many of the same people that were in Iraq in 2003 and 2004 were in Afghanistan in 2001 and two and three. And in fact, a lot of the torture that we know was done in Afghanistan in Bagram and at uh, the salt uh, pit and other places was done by the same people that then went on to, uh, to Iraq. Uh, some of the things though that, that uh, we should be thinking about in terms of what happened in Afghanistan and now the International Criminal Court that may take up some of the cases of torture in Afghanistan. Um, you know, in, in uh, uh, October and November of, of 2001, there was a massacre, a massacre of over 2000 Afghans, Taliban, uh, by one of the warlords, General Dostum, uh, who up uh, after the Battle of Kanduz took, uh, captured, so, uh, ta captured Taliban and others and put them in big trucks and took them out to the desert and then shot into the trucks, killing over 2,000 people with American special forces standing right by. They were standing right by as all of that happened. The bodies were put in very shallow graves there and there's a movie about this. It's called Afghan Massacre, Convoy of Death. Nobody's ever been held accountable of that. General Dostum went on to become the Deputy Minister of Defense of Afghanistan under the Karzai uh, administration. And he's now one of the vice presidents of the country under uh, uh, President Ashraf Ghani. So, when you talk about all people holding accountable things that have happened in Afghanistan, and that's one of the things in the International Criminal Court, it's not just holding US accountable or Australians accountable, it's also Afghan officials accountable for what uh, they have done to their, their own people. There are other movies that have shown a lot of the atrocities of 
of uh, what the U.S. did uh, to people in Afghanistan and the horrific conditions they were kept under. One of them is called Taxi to the Dark Side, about four young UK Pakistanis who had gone to Pakistan on a trip from the UK and then for some crazy reason took a taxi across into Afghanistan just as the US was coming into Afghanistan. And of course they were uh, alleged to be uh, supporters of the Taliban and they were tortured for for years and, and were some of the first people that actually were sent to Guantanamo. And that's another part of what we should be talking about in terms of the torture of, of the U.S. What we have done to 779 people that the U.S. sent to Guantanamo, the very first ones going in January 11th of 2002, only 5% of those that were sent to, F, to Guantanamo were actually captured by U.S. military. The rest of them were all part of a bounty program where you could get money for turning in your neighbor, turning in anybody you didn't like. And that's how the U.S. got all of these people that they put into uh, to Guantanamo. Now, how many people, here it is 19 years later, how many people are still in Guantanamo? There are 40 that are still there. 26 of them have already been cleared for release. Uh, Five of them were under the Obama administration, were supposed to be released, but they weren't. Uh, they, the Obama administration convinced the Trump administration to release one person, one person. So there's still 40 of them that are left. Of the 779, uh, one has died of cancer, one died of heart attack, and seven of them supposedly committed suicide. And one of the very interesting parts of all of Guantanamo is that three of them committed suicide on the same night. And it was not in the prison in Guantanamo. They, the three of them had been taken to a site off the prison grounds. And one of them was, was found with uh, hanging from a door with a sock in his mouth. I mean, there were so many things that were uh, evidence of US military killing these, these three men. Uh, nobody's ever been held, held accountable for that. Uh, nobody has been being held accountable for the, the people that are still in, at, in the prison in Guantanamo. And that's one of the things that has, uh, is a part of this international criminal court case that has been brought by the Center for Con Constitutional Rights out of New York City and also by Reprieve out of the UK, that they are, are bringing the cases of some of the 40 men that are still there and asking, why are you, the United States, still keeping these people? Many of them uh, were taken to the secret sites of uh, the CIA in Bulgaria, Romania, Latvia, Thailand. I mean, you name it, and, and the U.S. was torturing people. Syria, we were torturing people everywhere. We were getting the agreement of countries to be able to use their torture facilities to torture the people that the United States wanted. So right now, the, uh, the International Criminal Court, have, having gone through a process of its own, where initially the prosecutors request to have this investigation of the allegations that had been brought by, the, by US human rights people, UK human rights people, French, German, Spanish, because some of their, because some of their citizens or some of their facilities had been used by these, I should say, their citizens. Um, all of these cases were at first denied by the International Criminal Court, but just this year in March, the appellate division of the International Criminal Court said there is sufficient evidence and the special prosecutor can bring the cases. Well, for the human rights people, that was really, really great. However, for the Trump administration, it was like, uh-uh, the United States has never acceded to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. And that was one of the reasons that I actually resigned from the government in 2003. As a U.S. diplomat, I was being told, you go to the Mongolian government and you convince them to, uh, to, to agree with Article 99, which, which gives, which uh, takes the U.S. out of any jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court. And it was like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not taking that to the ambassador. You take you get paid more than I do, you do that. Well, the U.S. Is, uh, says that it's not uh, uh, a part of the International Criminal Court, so don't bother us with all of these allegations. 
but they were allegations of sufficient magnitude that the Trump administration has now put sanctions on members of the court of the International Criminal Court. The special prosecutor and a, a, an alternate special prosecutor are now forbidden to enter the United States. And anyone in the International Criminal Court that has does any investigation on the cases against the United States and also against the state of Israel for its actions against Palestinians, then they can no longer come to the United States. Well, over a hundred uh, organizations in many countries have pushed back against that because it's a blatant uh, protection of criminal acts that have been committed by, uh, by U.S. military. So there's a lot that, that is going on in terms of the Center for Constitutional Rights, Reprieve, the American Civil Liberties Union, a lot of organizations. I mean, we know the history of all of these men that are still remaining in uh, Guantanamo that should be released. Out, there have only been eight convictions, eight convictions out of the 779, only eight. Five of the people that were convicted are now back in their home countries. Two have been equipped, uh, convicted and are still in Guantanamo. A second one is awaiting his sentence to be, uh, to, uh, be sentenced because he agreed with a plea that uh, he was presented with. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of information that's around about what uh, the U.S. has done in Afghanistan over the, over the years. Uh, Peter mentions the whole issue of assassin drones and the thousands, thousands of uh, drone strikes that have happened uh, killing uh, innocent civilians. So there's plenty for the U.S. to uh, atone for. And all I can hope is that uh, uh, there is karma in the world for those who have committed all of these terrible, terrible things and are truly war criminals. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh... To atone for something, you have to first acknowledge it happened. <clears throat> U.S. history of their many, many wars and such a short history the United States has uh, is replete with massacres. The Philippine war that no one in the United States talks about, no one in school has ever taught about that. The incredible amounts of massacres that outraged Mark Twain at the time. And then uh, in the First World War, there was all the First World War using poison gas, all the sides did. Uh, the, what I think the largest war crime in history is the dropping of the two atomic bombs in Japan when most U top U.S. generals, including Eisenhower and MacArthur, opposed doing that. There was absolutely no reason. We don't want to open this debate, but there was no reason. Uh, a lot of historians say now for, for that to have been used as Japan would have surrendered as long as they were allowed to keep the emperor, which they eventually were able to do. And then, of course, we have Korea, where the Associated Press in 1999 only that was uh, almost exact almost 50 years later revealed this massacre of, by u.s soldiers of refugees in a no gun re um that has not been denied this is that's been proven of course in vietnam there were many 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 massacres there we only really learned about the milai case uh in all of vietnam there was only 203 u.s military personnel charged and 57 court martialed only 23 were convicted in milai only one was convicted, at least then, though, they listened to a whistleblower, Ronald Ridenauer, who came to Congress and the State Department, depending on, they listened to him, they actually investigated it. Then there was a journalist, Seymour Hirsch, who broke the story, won a Pulitzer Prize for that, and uh, they actually convicted someone. Look at what happened with Assange. Um, the, the whistleblower was thrown in jail. The journalist didn't get a Pulitzer Prize. He was thrown in jail. And there's been no, not only no convictions, no investigation. So what I'm asking you about is this culture of impunity, this long history. And there's also the Turkey shoot in the first Gulf War. They, they shot all those retreating Iraqi soldiers in the back, the highway of death that was called. And this was all filmed. It's uh, Iraqi soldiers being bulldozed in their trenches by American bulldozers, just buried alive. It's gotten to the point where because they feel like they can get away with it, they don't even care that this stuff comes out. So talk to me a little bit, and about this culture of impunity, how can it change? Because let's face it, Americans are told they're the greatest people in the world, and they want to, they don't want to accept that their government could do this. And there might be a little of that in Australia, too, that people can't accept that their government and their soldiers could do such things. How could this ever change this culture of impunity? 
Well, I doubt if it ever will, because the people that can change it are the ones that are part of the problem. The senior military are the ones that are protecting the junior military and protecting themselves against uh, allegations that they did nothing to investigate these things. Uh, so it's, it's a real problem with uh, a professional military where they, they are taught the laws of land warfare, which say you can't murder innocent civilians. Uh, and there are actually rules to how you conduct war, but those rules are broken all the time and no one is ever, ever held accountable. So the, the way to prevent it is to prevent wars, because if you got wars, you got military going into them and you're going to have these atrocities. And if we want to prevent the atrocities, we've got to figure out how to prevent the wars. Well, Ann, that's, uh, that's a great answer, actually. <laughs> and, and Peter, I want to bring you both in here because these these are really not Australia's wars. What what threat did Afghanistan or the Taliban pose to Australia? I don't think it posed any threat to the United States either. So it, these are American wars, and when the U.S. tells Canberra we have to join our war, you know I don't know how who salutes quicker than there's a knee jerk reaction of obedience. And this also has to do with, of course, being part of the five eyes and, and sharing intelligence information. I might be a big part of it. But why could this incident uh, of the war crimes report now by the inspector, could this begin a soul searching in Australia where they begin to reassess their relationship with the U.S., their military policy and think we shouldn't get involved in these damn wars? Because look what it's done. Look, one would hope that there would be a... Um a soul searching and um, and to a limited extent yes there will be a soul searching but um but unfortunately very powerful forces control the narrative and therefore the narrative about this is going to be um rotten apples and therefore a thoroughgoing uh response which is what's needed um i don't imagine will will, will happen um, um you know, I mean, the media's role, you know, I'm not saying anything new that anyone watching this doesn't know, and that is that the media is there to to, to keep the show on the road. And um, you asked earlier, why did, uh, why did Australia invade Afghanistan? Well, I have to reveal here for the first time on your program that Australia was under massive threat if it didn't invade Afghanistan. And that wasn't from Afghanis. That was from the United States. If we don't obey uh, what our alliance requires, there are consequences. Those consequences uh, in the nth degree resulted, and people keep raising it, 1975, we had a prime minister removed from power without, without the electorate being involved. And um, and it wasn't a CIA coup as such, uh, but it was a, uh, a coming together of the powerful forces that wanted this guy, this, this uh, prime minister, out. And those powerful forces, including, as we now know from the palace letters, um, in, involved the Queen and, uh, and the royal family and, the, and supporters around that. So therefore, no doubt, um, uh, MI6 and, and the British establishment wanted to get rid of Gough Whitlam, you know, so-called lefty prime minister. So if, if those sort of forces are there and we all, and, and people in the Labor Party are aware of this, then, you know, who's going to, uh, who's going to say no? Um, the first Gulf War in the early 90s, the very first country to put its hand up to support saving the Kuwaitis from uh, from the Iraq invasion, which, as we know, April Glasby had kind of given the nod to occur anyway. Um, that's a longer story. Um, the first one was Australia, uh, Bob Hawke, a Labor Prime Minister, the, the first Labor Prime Minister since the sacking, uh, well, the dismissal, the overthrow of Whitlam. So this new, brand new, shiny uh, Labor Prime Minister was being extremely obsequious and trying to earn uh, favour on many levels, including, you know, uh, being the first to offer to send special forces and I think uh, ships and, and, and other materials. So uh, um, what are we scared of? Well, terrorism has 
skyrocketed in, in number of deaths in the West since uh, since we all did the invasions post 9-11. Um, just look at the graph. Just look at the graph of, of terrorist attacks on the West. And it just, it, it's bouncing along, bouncing along, you know, at very, very low levels, you know, very remote, you know, one-off little events. And then there's the spike for, for the attack in New York and Washington. And then it's low level and low level. And then as soon as the, the Western invasions of the Middle East start occurring, sure, it just skyrockets because it's revenge, isn't it? You know, 2,000 dead, 2000 dead children. You know, what are you going to do if you're a parent? It's going to go turn the other cheek. I want to interject. Instead of a war for terrorism, it was a war for terror. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, well, well, all of our techniques are terror creating. I mean, terror is is the, you know it's it's a drone. Um, terror is a knock on the door at three a.m. by an Australian SAS soldier. You know, there's both sides use terror, and um, all sides use terror, and uh, it, it you know unfortunately the. The victims are nameless and, and in their thousands. Um, why does Australia do this? Well, because it's, uh, you know, it's very historical, Joe, and it's, it's got a lot to do with uh, the British Empire and its role uh, in the world and, and the US taking over the mantle of that last century. And um, as the most powerful military force that the world has ever, ever imagined or seen, the United States uses that force and Australia has to make a decision, you know. George W. Bush said it, you know, you're either on our side or you're against us. And, um, and Australia's leaders believe that the best thing for Australia is to be on the side of America because they know the damage that can be done to us if we're not. And that's sad reality, um, but it is the case. I mean... Just recently, Australia agreed to allowing the stationing of B-52 bombers, not stationing, the, the, the refuelling and uh, maintenance of, of US long-range B-52 bombers in Australia. No public debate. Almost no public reporting. Um, no parliamentary debate of whether it's a great idea at this time of escalating uh, 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 conflict, potential conflict with China. We just do it. We just say yes, and we're doing it. And um, you know, why does Australia do it? Well, it's it, it's our historical role, uh, is what I would say. And um, and no one's been brave enough to say enough. And maybe Whitlam was was trying to do that. Maybe Whitlam was looking for a middle course um, out of this. Um, he, you know, he wasn't opposed to US bases in Australia, just despite what people think. He, he was a moderate, he was in the middle, he was trying to, but even that was too much. Um, so I, I think Australia's kind of stuck and it's going to take more than um, uh, some massacres alleged by, by our soldiers for a major change. Um, I, I don't know what it'll be. Um, uh, yep, <laughs> I'm stumped. I don't know the answer. Well, the, the long shadow of, of Gulf Whitman's overthrow still rules is what you're saying. Uh, if I could just mention, one of the things that we try to, to use in the U.S. Uh, to, to challenge wars are uh, the effects that the, the wars have on, on uh, us, on the yep. people of the U.S., and particularly uh, veterans. And when you see that over 22 veterans now are committing suicide every day, when you mm. see the numbers of families that have been just devastated by uh, the, the stories, the memories. And uh, Peter, you talked about the psychologist that was working with the, uh, the SAS guys and the stories that she heard that they were finally letting out. They were telling other people because there was something that was, that was in their soul that they were not able now to live with. And when you look at the numbers, the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of young men and women uh, in our countries that uh, are now suffering from the wars, yeah. uh, it's, it's over. while there are certainly more people from Afghanistan and Iraq that have been killed uh, tragically by our forces, 
uh, the level of destruction of our youth, of our countries by the politicians that put our countries in these wars is enormous. And the amount yeah. of money that's paid to try to keep them going, both mentally and physically, is a huge, huge amount that is never factored into the calculation of what the war is going to cost when they start talking about, well, let's go invade and occupy this or that country. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the issue, Anne, you, you make of um, PTSD and the and the response of veterans. I, I remember some classic film from the Vietnam years of, of fellows throwing their purple hearts over the fence uh, into the grounds of the White House. And I'd always thought, well, that, that's where some decent resistance can come from. But unfortunately, the, the negative effects of what they bring back home with them is it, so so often internalised um, and taken out on their families and, and themselves by the suicide, and and uh, and I know that uh, you know the depression suffered by the children of vets is enormous, because yeah it's it's internalised. Well, you know our political education is that individuals united can't really do anything. We just have to rely on the system to fix everything. So therefore. You know, it doesn't, um, you know, there's thousands of vets who are not happy with this. And, um, you know, unfortunately, it, it's, their, it's their partners who know the darkest side of this and, um, and their families. And unfortunately, it, it, it doesn't break out into that uh, movement. I know um, Code Pink and I know the work of all sorts of groups and, I, you know, very supportive of, of that sort of um, uh, voice. Um, but, um, it, you know, w when those negative effects are internalised, you, you really see that somehow a positive outcome is, is not going to come from PTS sufferers, PTSD sufferers. Sad to say, you know, that they need all their support and their families need the support. But to, to imagine, so where does, where does it come from? Well, it's got to come from the, you know, Sad to say, again, the educated middle classes have to open their eyes and realise that, you know, the system they're comfortably riding along on is, is based on some pretty nasty things. And then finally, um, finally, uh, you, you know, talk about it, unite, organise, become active and, and try, try at least to do something. I mean, you know, you've been very active and you've, you've done a lot of... Um, uh, a lot of things and um do, you know people must be also frustrated that it, that you know like code pink it's an amazing i mean i see events and things that are done and um but the system just grinds on and um Between how do you cope with that so um, you know we've got a lot of good organizations that keep pushing pushing and we know that we're pushing uphill uh, that still the, the psyche of the U.S. public and certainly of the most of the political class is that war is not a problem. And war <laughs> is just part of our nature. And um, uh, yeah. my kids aren't going to go. They don't have to go. But uh, these other kids will go if we say so. And so working with the other kids to say, mm. don't go, <laughs> is, yep. is one of the things. But it is... Um, um, you know, it's a real challenge because the history of the United States, as uh, Joe was talking about, is nothing but warmongering. And uh, with the uh, new Biden administration, well, one thing you can you can hand to the Trump administration, even even though he's torn up all sorts of treaties, arms control treaties, all this sort of stuff, uh, other than an, an, a reassignment of some in in Syria, uh, he hasn't started anything, and that's. Yeah. Uh, Yep. <laughs> that's a godsend, but he's wrecked havoc on everything else. But yep. uh, the Biden administration, I mean, we, we're already, uh, you know, pushing back from what we know uh, could happen because of what happened during the Obama administration with increases in the numbers of people in Afghanistan with, um, uh, you know, just a whole litany of things. So, um, Absolutely. And you, yep, you are. We, we can see it, can't we? We can see the Biden administration ahead. It's going to be another sad Obama. And unfortunately, um, the people who are going to die at the moment are sitting around in cafes in the Middle East or taking their kids to school. and They have no idea they're soon to die. And it'll yeah. be drones or bombs or guns, however it'll happen. Yes. The, the history of 
the Democrats um, in in power of the you know the last few administrations isn't a happy one, and unfortunately, people have stars in their eyes, and believe that uh, or, you know this is Nirvana on a stick. You know, Biden is not Nirvana on a stick. You know, Biden yeah. is going to be um, the instrument of very powerful forces that will wind up the war machine and get cracking again because uh, Trump. Trump was only interested in business deals. You know, he, he wasn't. He, he didn't want. He didn't have empire stars in his eyes. He had business deals in his eyes. Um, and now he's out of the way. Um, it's it's back to uh, more humanitarian wars, saving the world from uh, from itself. Wonderful. <laughs> you know, uh, Peter, you um, you talk about people in the Middle East cafes. And their lives may be cut short. Uh, w- and I'm going to link this to what you said earlier about this being revenge, these wars, uh, the terrorism that has increased in the West is revenge. And we never allowed to listen to what the terrorists say. They're telling you why. They're saying in statements that they are taking revenge for you killing our children. You're killing yeah. our families. Uh, but this, in- yeah. told to shut that out and they kill us, as Bush said, because they're jealous of us. Yeah. <laughs> They're not jealous, man. The only reason refugees become refugees is, you know, there's a small proportion who are after a job in the West. Yeah, okay. The 30 million on the move at the moment, they're only refugees because we bombed the fuck out of their countries. They're not refugees because they they want to go to Disneyland. You know, they're refugees. They're compelled to be refugees to survive. So, yeah, look, we're, you know, I, I don't know, it's a... Uh, I don't know. Ask the question. Sorry, I'm not sure where I'm going on this, but it is it is tough to, to imagine that there are kids at schools, parents taking them off to schools, holding their sweet little hands, waving them goodbye. And, you know, in, in four years' time, you know, we'll be hearing the numbers who died in X country. It'll probably be Iran, but I'm just speculating. I don't know where it'll be. Who knows? But... Those people are destined to die because we didn't change the system. Those people are destined to die because the drones still take off and Pine Gap still helps them target people on the ground in the Middle East. And Australian bombers, well, they're not over Syria at the moment, but they have been Australian fighter bombers. So we haven't changed that system. So those people are destined to die. And it's horrible to predict the future and imagine what's going to happen. And, you know, no one's got a crystal ball. But history tells us a few things. And, and history suggests that, uh, that the powerful do not use their powers that wisely, that they tend to, uh, to use them to dominate. So we're, we're in for an interesting time under Biden. And I'll be very interested to see the, the, the small L liberals trying to justify the next war. I understand that the governments might be afraid what could happen to them, given what happened to Gough Whitlam, who uh, removed Australian troops from Vietnam and maybe made designs on Pine Gap and all of that. But what's the excuse of the Australian population? Why aren't they demanding sovereignty uh, against the United States? And I wanted to ask Anne, too, what from her perspective, from an American perspective, how the empire works. How, what is the feeling towards vassal states, we might say, like Australia? Yeah, Anne. <laughs> Tell me. <laughs> um, well, I think it's to be used. Uh, the vassal states are to be used by the the mighty empire of the United States. And you know, when you were talking about the, uh, how Australia uh, joined up with the coalition of the willing very, very quickly. Well, another part of that, uh, when I was out in Mongolia at the uh, embassy there, we were told, "You go get some uh, some Mongolians." to volunteer, get the, uh, the Mongolian <sighs> government to volunteer, you know, 10 people, 15 people. We don't care how yep. many, but we can add Mongolia's name to this list of the Coalition of the Willing. But wow. Australia has been there pretty, uh, pretty easily because of long-time ties, I guess, with uh, doing, uh, doing the bidding of the United States for quite a long period of time. Uh, yeah, I, look, it is just a flag-waving exercise to some extent, and... Um, Boy, you know, um, uh, I don't. How can it change? Is you know, how can vassal states escape the grip of the mightiest empire the world has ever seen? Um, and escape, we must. I mean, we must escape it because 
we're going to be involved in eventually nuclear wars in the Middle East. Yeah. And we're going to well, be providing the intelligence to Saudi Arabia or whoever the fuck else to allow these <laughs> things to happen because Saudi wants to go nuclear. So therefore yeah. they're our friends. So therefore we help them. I mean, this has got a terrible sort of arc in history, you know, that we're chasing at the moment. You know, we've, we've got to sort of divert it. Yeah. And um, as a little vassal state down here in the Pacific, um, we're going to be there, you know, we're going to be there. It's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's so depressing. The people have got the power in their hands, of course. Uh, people across the world in Western countries have got the power. We have some, some level of democracy. But unfortunately, we're lied to. You know, we have the Murdoch press here that is just, you know, in some, in some locations in Australia, there is no other media available. Murdoch's got it all. And, and therefore, the lies they tell, the, the narrative, that, the bullshit narrative that they create about whether it's a war or whether it's about a new trade deal that's being done or whether it's a new mining venture that's got to go ahead or whether it's global warming that we need to ignore or whatever. The role of propaganda is uh, central to this. I, you know, I believe the people have got people pretty smart and if they're given the facts, otherwise it wouldn't be a journo. I mean, if given the facts, um, yeah. they'd have a chance, at least a chance. One question from Kathy Vogan, our producer. How would the Australian public react when they see that 3,000 medals are stripped from these elite forces or do they don't give a damn about that? The medals being stripped from... So did you say 3,000? Yeah, that's what yeah, I saw reported, yeah. 3, oh, my gosh. Look, they have taken a citation of one of the troops, one of the SAS troops. I mean, they'll, they'll do these things. It'll, it'll, you know, people will say sorry. The War Memorial is still going to spend half a billion dollars on extending uh, it, 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 its disnification of, of war, its glamorization of war. I mean, with a bit of sadness mixed in, just, just to make it feel genuine. Look, I, yes, um, you know, there will be some spectacular stories to come out of these prosecutions that lay ahead of these SAS soldiers. But, uh, but the system, meanwhile, ticks along and the commanders keep on commanding, and yep. Well, Peter, let's leave it there. Um, we've had a very interesting discussion on these issues, and it's not going to go away soon, so maybe we'll have you back at some point when the next war crimes report comes out. That's <laughs> good. Um, thank that's you, Anne, uh, Colonel Ann Wright down there in Hawaii, and Peter over here in Sydney. It was a, a great discussion, and I appreciate you both coming on. CN Live. So goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Get out your notebook. There's more.